Hi everyone. This is Shubha from Finance League of Cupertino. I would like to welcome you all to the demo by uh, ma master artist uh, Debbie Barker. Let me introduce Debbie Barker to you uh, before we get started with the demo. Today, Debbie is going to show, show us uh, the watercolor uh, painting and Debbie is a hyper realism master color artist. Debbie is hyper sometimes too, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's, it's great to have Debbie showing us on uh, this uh, fine form of watercolor art. And also today she will talk about uh, some of her uh, earlier works. So we get to know some secrets about her work actually. <laughs> and she was going to show it over the, 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 the PowerPoint presentations uh, uh, over the screen. So we'll get to know about more of her work and about Debbie herself. So she uh, graduated in uh, business of, sorry, Bachelor of Fine Arts. Uh, in illustrations uh, from Universal, Universal Academy in 2011. And before that, uh, she was an uh, elementary school teacher and she was a reading specialist for children with disability. She also helped uh, uh, many teachers getting credentials, uh, getting teaching credentials for adults. And she's been a continuous learner and she has she holds five degrees so far. Yeah. Maybe you may be going for one more, I think. So that way you're <laughs> going. So, and today she's going to show, uh, uh, so she may not be able to show the complete artwork because she's, as we know, she's a hyper realistic artist. So it takes a long time, but she's going to share some of the tips and tricks of creating uh, hyper realistic watercolor color paintings. Exactly. With that, I hand it over to Debbie. So over to you, Debbie. Thank you, Shuba. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show you um, some of the things that make my uh, painting what people consider hyper-realism. Um, but the truth is I never considered myself a hyper-realistic uh, watercolor artist. It was not my intention. Um, my intention always is to try to capture the nuances in what we see around us that, that contain everyday joy around us. Um, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, was famous for saying that people don't really know how to appreciate a flower because they don't look at a flower. And that's because they don't slow down long enough to really, really take a look at it. So my my mission is to create artwork that is large and bold and realistic and so that people have to stop and really look at those details and go, wow, I never noticed that before. And that just, just fills my heart and makes me feel good. So that's why I do what I do. Now, um, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to Chuba for taking care of all the technology for me. It's such a relief. I don't have to uh, figure out anything and change views and things like this. But um, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to show you just a few photos of my artwork. And mm -hmm. then if you can see, I also, you can see my picture. Uh, I'm on two cameras right now. There's one camera of me and there's one camera of a still life with oranges and blue and a blue bowl. And um, that's what I'm going to show you how I would tackle a project like that. Um, my painting is very slow. It's very meticulous and it has a lot of layers. So it's not um, something that's very spontaneous that I can just get out there and just throw paint around and you'd get an idea of how it works. But um, there are a lot of really great little tricks and tips that get me from one step to the other. So I'm just going to show you some of those things along the way that help me achieve what I'm, my hyper-realism. Uh, so let me go ahead. Oh, you have disabled my sharing. Okay, I will, I'm going to share and also can I go uh, Facebook Live when you're showing, showing your work? Uh, sure. Okay. I'm only going to show for a few minutes. I'm going to keep moving fast, I'm hoping, yeah. uh, to see how much I can cover. Uh, 
find you first. Oh, you find it's Okay. There we go. And just. Uh, okay. There. Can we see it? Yes, we can see it. Let me just can you give me one second? Let me just uh, start showing uh, before you move on to the next one. Okay. Because I like this. People, uh, we like to watch this later also. Yeah, well, let me, uh, it's, it's getting ready. Yes. Okay, we'll get started. All right, I'm just going to show you uh, a half dozen pieces, some of my recent work uh, in the hyperrealism that um, uh, you can see in this piece, just the, uh, the detail in the crystal and the, the threads on the fabric, the detail in the orange. Those are the things that just excite me so much when I can capture those amazing little details. Um, here's another one uh, that was uh really fascinating to try to create the shapes and at the same time show all the warping of the uh geometric shapes uh in the in the silver um this piece is really special to me um i studied with a uh, hyper realistic watercolor painter lauren mccracken last year and he invited me to join the united states team uh, of painters to exhibit in uh, Fabriano, Italy last year. Unfortunately, it was uh, canceled and went live. And uh, but the painting is still in Italy and it's still it's going to end up on display uh, for next year as well. So um, this was one of the pieces that really pushed me to the next level in my my hyper realism. Um, I love crystal. I love transparencies, translucencies, reflections, all the things that can happen at the same time, the distortions uh, are wonderful. Um, yeah, another one with a twist. Um, I do a lot of flowers. I'm going to, but uh, so just so you know, I don't do just fruits and flowers and still life, but I, um, I have a whole marble series that I've done. And some of you may be uh, familiar with my uh, realistic uh, succulent paintings that I do. Uh, and lately I've been going extra large full sheet and doing some uh, peony paintings. Um, and this is my last peony painting. That's a full sheet watercolor. And uh, we're gonna come back to these things, uh, to these paintings um, after a while, because I, after I talk about some of the things that my principles, I wanna be able to come back and show you, or at least have you look at these paintings, go, oh, I see how she used that. I see how she used that. I, I see how she used that. So that, that's some of the work I do. Uh, very different, the still life, the florals, um, as well as um, I have a couple of other nature collections. Um, but they all have that same uh, goal to just share the exuberance of life and uh, the joy that, that I'm trying to capture. So today, look at this, and I'm, I, excuse me for doing it all in Photoshop, but I know how to do Photoshop. I'm actually doing this all with a, um, on my iPhone. <laughs> so uh, this is really new for me to be doing this online. Um, the first thing, uh, so this is the, the painting that I've been um, working on uh, preparing this week to show you some of the steps. One of the things I was asked to do today, and I'm only gonna spend five minutes on this, um, hopefully, but was to talk about how, how and why I set up my compositions the way I do. And I only have three things that I really pay attention to in terms of composition. Um, and the first one, which you probably, I'm sure you're familiar with, where's my keyboard, is um, uh, the rule of thirds. Um, so, whoa, let's get that going again. There we go. Okay, so, the back of the table, there's my first rule of thirds. And uh, here's my second 
uh, third down here. Look how beautifully that kind of goes right down that, that shadow line in here. And the reason I set it up, so the rule of thirds always gives you great places to put your focal points and points of interest. And you see what happens there is you see what we've got there. We've got a change of color, change of textures, change of values, change of details, all happening right where we have the cross and the rule of thirds. Um, now, but on top of that, if you look, I've got right across here, I've got another third, one of the lines of thirds. And so that gives me a very natural place to break my composition for the top color uh, break for that high contrast. And another third here gives me, goes right down the middle of this as a secondary composition on the page. So that's number one rule of thirds. The second thing is I always try to do things asymmetrical and especially at different heights. So I do a, a lot of compositions that have the asymmetrical upside down V shape in them. And if it's a vertical piece, you'll sometimes you'll see that I've gone, I've done the same thing with the V shape, but a, uh, going sideways for a vertical piece. Last thing, and I think one of the most important things on composition is uh, channels of motion. So I'm very careful to try to put pieces in place that ask you to come in and take a, a closer look at the artwork. Okay, so, and look at this, this beautiful handle come around here and what does it do? It comes around the plate and it comes right back into that uh, rule of thirds uh, location on it. Um, so this is what, so my, these, you see, I've got this swoop, I've got those, they're coming up and they're coming back up again and they create these pa patterns and channels on that. Um, I, I, you might see this a couple times tonight, but here's another one that I've been working on in the same series. Again, you see the rule of thirds, the rule of thirds goes right through there, goes right through here and, and creates, this one has the most interest uh, in the focal point in there and you've got the asymmetry of height right uh, that goes on and then the focal point now we got a lot of focal points on this but it, the main ones when you look at coming outside you see what happens and look at this even this one is pointing and it's coming around and we have that same action that draws you around to the center now, when you've got something like this and you think, well, all of, <laughs> it takes a lot of photographs to get things all in place. Um, the main ones that are standing out here, and even this one, even though I wanted that one for variety to go in the other direction, um, you see it brings it right back around. And then I could put in things sticking in every which way, but the ones that are, are directing your eye against the highest contrast area are um, uh, drawing your eye into the center of the painting rather than um, uh, flipping your, your eye out of the painting. So those are the three things, the rule of thirds, the asymmetrical V and the, uh, um, the angles of motion that um, the different objects create. Um, so that's all I'm gonna talk about in terms of how I create the compositions. Uh, let's see, get this back centered. Okay, um, so now I'm, I'm gonna show you just a, two pictures. I wanna show you my setup, how I take the photographs uh, because I've come up with uh, five areas. The more I take classes with people and I, watch, I work with people and I watch people paint and the things people are having trouble with, as well as the feedback I get on my own art, um, taking the photographs for a hyperrealism piece is one of the most essential pieces uh, of watercolor. We can't, as watercolorists, go back and finesse things uh, the way other additive paint can, have, can do it, like uh, acrylic and oil painting, where you can add things in, you can shift, you can adjust. So our photo and the choices we make right up front are absolutely critical to the success of the painting in a way that um, other mediums are not. I wanted to sh just show you, I take my photos on my iPhone 
And um, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but if you, on an, uh, on an iPhone, I don't know if this is true for other phones, if you um, plug in your headphones, uh, and you can click on the headphone volume button and it will take photos for you. So you don't have to hold on to your phone and click your phone and jiggle and reset um, the uh, focus every time you can set it once and then uh, just use your headset and don't touch your phone. So here's my whole setup. So you, you see, I put my, um, uh, I have a clamp. I can do, you can see I have the apples, I have the figs, I have the oranges, and I think I have a fourth one, I can't remember, grapes. And I've set them all up, so now all my pieces all have the same height, the same angles. Um, I put a, just the black the black board in the background so that um, I have a, a continuous background of the black. I had to do this in the daytime, so over here I had to, um, put up some fabric to block the extra light sources. There's my, you see, there's where, where I take my pictures. I can just move back and forth and back and forth, adjust things in my still life. And I can just take pictures with my, uh, with my headset and I don't ever have to move my camera. It's such a wonderful trick. Now, the only other thing I wanted to show you, and this is really essential, is I have this fabulous light uh, it goes continuously light and dark, it goes warm, it goes cool. But the best thing about it is I put this light on a standing lamp. And once I've got everything set up and I've got the composition where I want it, um, I can move this lamp to, I can move it one foot closer, two feet closer, three feet closer. I can move it farther to the left. I can move it to the right. I can bring the light down and up and move the shadows around on the piece until I get a real dramatic uh, setup where I have the shadows moving in ways that add an extra element uh, to the composition. Uh, so when I'm all said and done, I usually have somewhere between, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 photos uh, then that I open in Photoshop and figure out which one has created the best pattern of um, shadows and composition for me. Okay, um, so uh, any, any questions about all this? That's all I'm going to do to talk about my setup and how I get my photos. Does anybody have any questions? All right, please feel free to jump in and ask questions. I have no problem if you uh, unmute and want to uh, ask something or get clarification about something I've said. Uh, hi, Debbie. This is Natasha here. Hi. Can you please let us know the light that you're using in the chat box so that we can go and look for it? Um, you know what? I'm not, I don't remember the name of the light. Um, uh, Shuba or Janki, is it possible to, um, I'm going to give you people my, um, uh, my email and if uh, there's things like that that I've missed um, either uh, Falk or myself will make sure we get it out to everybody. Sure, sure. Um, this is actually meant it's extremely expensive and and that light this light is meant for gallery lighting uh, but it works beautifully you just screw it into a, a light fixture so I got a really cheap uh, standing lamp at Target and it has a swing arm that goes up and down so I can change the height um of the angle so um shuba is that all right or okay. thank yeah, you? I can, yeah i can take this and then send, send it across to thank him. you okay now i'm moving around a little bit because i'm trying to get at uh i've got a a zoom message right over top of my next picture okay yeah so we've got a great photo we've got great lighting we've got interesting shadows we've got a great composition and then i also take extra photos just because uh you know those figs don't always look the same by the time you get to painting the figs a week and a half later <laughs> and it's really nice to have some heavy some really high detail photos so i'll go in and take uh extra photos of all those tiny little details so that i understand it Okay, where's the next one? Okay, so um, so that's number one, uh, is it, how, how I set up the photos. Um, with this is, um, 
what I cut with in the drawing. So for me, I've actually identified Debbie has has discovered five D's that are really, really critical to hyper realistic painting. And the first D is how you do your drawing. Um, I do use graphite paper, but I want to uh, tell you a couple things. I use a light box and um, I this over here. This is a um, it's a glossy photo full size for the uh, the image. And the reason I start with a glossy photo instead of printing it out on regular paper is if you put a glossy photo up on the window or put it up on uh, a light box, you can see the details so much better than you can on a regular piece of paper so that you can really finesse the details on it. I never just print out a picture and uh, stick some graphite paper under it and then start drawing. Uh, first of all, you press too hard. You get a lot of graphite on the um, uh, on the artboard itself, on, on your watercolor paper. Um, and it's very hard as you get tangled up if you're using a red pen and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're getting caught up in all these lines in here. You can't necessarily see as well as you want to what you're drawing. So I always draw on tracing paper so that I have a really, really uh, careful line drawing that I thoroughly understand. And I never felt that this is a waste of time to spend the time to do this, this the extra work to get that line drawing. And as you could see, I always have, uh, I try to pull in all the objects so that I, I know what they look like. They're all sitting on my art table the figs, the cutting board, the fabric, the, the water jug, everything is, is there beside me. So I really understand my subject. Um, now, I also, you can see with, uh, I don't know anybody else who does this, but you see my graphite paper that's underneath here. And, you know, majority of artists uh, in watercolor have worked with graphite paper. But uh, because I'm left-handed, I always start on the right side and I work towards the left. Uh, but... I do not ever have the graphite paper under my hand because you tend to rub the graphite paper onto the watercolor paper. You get a residue from that and then you either have to, you have to rub it all out with eraser or it gets ground into the paper and it affects the color. Uh, so I just move it as I go along. I put it under a section, I work on it and then I move everything a little bit to the left. Okay. Uh, let me stop sharing that. And um, so let's grab some stuff. Um, so anything about that, about how I transfer the image? Uh, can you, you said you use the tracing paper, right? Uh, Not trace, yes, tracing paper. Okay, uh, how do you transfer from the, uh, okay. You take it on the transfer paper. Uh, tracing paper and then transfer using the graphite paper, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. So I take the photo, I put, uh, I put it on a light box and that's on my list too. I have a wonderful, really super easy light box that I can use. Oh. I'm going to hook it up. I put the photo on it. I put a piece of tracing paper on it and then I draw and then I, I um, make a really detailed line drawing. Oh. Once I have that line drawing, then I put it on my um, uh, put it on my watercolor paper. I use 300 watercolor paper. I hardly ever uh, I don't stretch and I usually don't tape it down. I like to be able to um, uh, work uh, very. I you'll you'll see all I'm all over the place when I'm <laughs> when I'm working. So I like to be able to move everything around. So you don't stick to the uh, you don't stretch and. Paste it, no. is it? So you move the paper. No, 300 pound does not need stretching. Oh, you can put tape on the back of it and stick it down if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything I do, I want to be able to paint right off the edges. And I'll show you in a sec. Okay. okay. So, Debbie, what light box uh, do you use? What brand? It is on the, it's on my handout. Okay. Uh, and where I got it, it's called the, from, it's from the uh, US Art Supply. Okay. Thank you. And it's fabulous. I have two sizes, but because it's so thin, even this size is, uh, can you see, you know, because um, 
it's so thin that you can just work in one area at a time. You don't even need a big one. Yeah, I used to have this big monster one that my husband and I built together. And, uh, and when I found this, I thought, why bother? <laughs> um, this works really, really well. Okay. So when you move on to the next one, so I want to tell everyone, I had, yeah, I had, uh, Debbie was very kind to send the list of uh, the materials uh, and I had forwarded it to everyone. So please, you can open that. And if you have any doubts, you can ask. It has a comprehensive list of all the materials. Okay, so this is, so this is the image and I had a pencil drawing um, and here's my pencil drawing. I had to make um, a decision about um, whether I wanted to do the background. I've started doing my backgrounds first instead of last. It's always a choice on hyperrealism, which way to go. Um, but I do really intense black backgrounds and there's pluses and minuses to both. And every hyperrealist person I know does it differently, but I'm gonna put the background in first in this painting and, and that way we're gonna finish with the end and, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll see why. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, I need to mask off the edges. And so what I do, and so is um, I take my, my uh, pencil drawing um, and I often will just photocopy it so that I have a couple copies of it because I'll often cut it apart and use it as a template uh, so I can use it for different masking. But I'm gonna actually cut this off and, and because I wanna keep and mask out the bottom area of the painting and keep the top uh, ready for use. So what I'm gonna end up with is, you see there's my pencil drawing Oh, and it's not the whole drawing because I, I did a few stages of this, so uh, I didn't want to have to do it each time. And then um, I put a layer of uh, tape on it. I use drafting tape. Again, it's on the list. I don't use masking tape and I don't use blue tape because I find it very distracting. Drafting tape works beautifully for everything that you do in the art artist. But what I'm going to show you is um, as I go through, um, and this doesn't matter so much for leaking, but it will matter later. Um, okay, so um, I put it down. Okay, and you put the razor blade on it, and then I pull against the razor blade. Do you see how I'm doing that? So uh, I never touch it. Like, can you move your paper a little bit? Uh, well, I think I'm centered, aren't I? Uh, I think let, let me spotlight only the paper so that. Are you not centered? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. there we go. Yeah. Mm. Okay, do you see? So I don't touch. Oh, the, yeah, thank you. So I don't get oils in it. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. And other times it will really matter if you get if you don't get a good uh, finishing edge on it. And uh, but so now I'm very close to the edge all the way around. Um, and uh, one of the things I find really frustrating. All right, let me. I'm going to go a little bigger here so you can see the other stuff. Uh, in demos, um, I've decided to use the PBO drawing gum. With, because it's colored so you can see what I'm doing um, uh, for this but um, and I'm not going to do the whole thing again and you know you don't need to sit here and watch me mask um, but the PBO is blue uh, I wrote on my list you can use anything except colored stuff and there's really good reason I'll show you later on it um, but most of you if you're watercolorists you know how to use masking um, I can get a lot done this is a number one brush uh, water, soap, wipe it off, and then I load it up. I start over on this side, okay, because I'm left-handed. But I have this kind of rule of thumb. I always cover about half an inch of masking tape, of the drafting tape, and I cover an inch of every crack. So um, I've been in, uh, I can't tell you how many uh, workshops I've been in, where um, artists are, uh, they pull it off and it's bled all underneath everything. 
and uh, it's because they're not getting into the cracks on here. Okay. Now the other thing is I always mask to get it nice. You'll see that I always mask with the tip of my bristles towards the line. So when I'm on this part, I will paint this side, you see? And then I will turn my paper around so that I'm still painting with my bristles touching, touching, touching the line, okay? Uh, wash out the brush when you're done. Uh, I would, you know, for something the size, I'd wash it a couple times, uh, get some soap on it, and then I shape it really nice to keep it nice and shape. I leave the soap in it, and it helps to keep the, the beautiful shape on the brush, and put it all away, and by the magic of, ta-da, there we go, it's all done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like I said, I don't want you to have to sit there and watch me do any of this. Okay, um, so backgrounds are always done with uh, multiple layers. And I tell you, if you've ever taken a workshop by Soon Warren, a uh, fabulous uh, hyper-realistic painter, she, um, she can take like a number two brush and put in a perfect background in black. It's just amazing what this woman can do. Um, but um, I'm just gonna show you a, a couple things. Uh, there's first- a, There's a question, what, what kind of soap have you used? Uh, this is, I'm using the master's brush cleaner and preserver, uh, but I just got a, um, another, soap I'm excited to use, but I don't have a container for it. I got Da Vinci's brush soap. Oh. And this is a pure, a pure vegetable oil um, uh, soap that's supposed to be really, really great for your natural bristle brushes, your sable brushes in particular. And this really, really does a good job on, on conditioning them. Okay, I love the PBO because it's so easy to see, but it, it it damages the paper and I'll show you, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. I'm going to, uh, because this picture has some blue in it and it has some orange in it, I thought, so you always need to put something down before the black. Uh, this one mistake people think is that you can get a really good black coverage by putting black paint down on a white piece of paper. And there's a couple reasons that doesn't really work to get the black background. Uh, so what I always do is I always start by finding a color from in my image uh, that to put in the background uh, to start with that. So my, my watercolor, um, I already mixed it up. I've got some, a couple different blues in there. Um, I put it right down on a towel and let me get this and I use the hockey brushes because they hold lots of water and they're really super soft. Now when watercolor paper hasn't got uh, any, it hasn't been painted on yet, um, it uh, does two things. One is a lot of the times the water just kind of skips over it and then all of a sudden it'll soak into the paper and it just sucks it in and it stays right where uh, you put it down. So I never ever start by putting uh, pigment down first the, uh, without the water on it first. And especially, and what, what I'm doing is I'm priming the paper. I'm getting the paper ready for the paint, for the future layers, because the next, it's the next layer that matters. This first, paper, this first layer isn't going to matter. And now that I've got that background, Nice. So I do that and I realize, boy, is it sucking up. There's areas that it just sucks up all the, uh, I'm going to put you up a little higher, sucks up all the water. Other areas don't. I want to wait until you're going to keep painting until you, uh, right in the lamp, um, uh, until it stays uniformly damp. Okay. This is so wonderful to be able to, um, put in a background without having to worry about 
painting around. Look at this one. This is the one with the figs. Can you imagine trying to put in a uniform background by painting in and out and in and out from all those shapes? It's just not possible uh, to, to get that in. So um, let's see how we're doing. Still need a little more. Okay. And um, I'm just going to put this wonderful background in. Uh, and then the, that paper, the next layer will just go on so beautifully smooth. And so you can see what I'm also doing with my, can you see that I'm lifting my paper? I'm moving my paper around. I, I want to always be, have that versatility to move things around. I can bend my paper. I can push the uh, pigment out to the edges and the sides and get it all nice and even. This coat doesn't matter that much, but, and then I can, if you tap it, you can get rid of that bead on the edges of the, uh, on the edges of the paper so that you don't have um, uh, big blossoms that come back in. So that's the first coat of the background, nice and easy. Uh, and it's only easy because we were able to uh, cover the edge and that's one of the advantages of putting your background in first. Boy, this makes it easy. Okay, so that is the first stage of that. And by the magic of television, <laughs> I've got it dry again. And um, oh, look at what I've done. That's all right, look at that, done. Um, and you see, I just put up a big towel on, on the table and I go right off the edges and you don't end up having trouble painting to the edges. If you have a piece of tape, if you've got it taped down on the edge here because you want to do 140, two things will happen. One is as a 140 page, it'll get, it'll ripple and stretch when it's super wet. Uh, and even though it will dry flat again, the pigment will lay in the valleys and it will shift to the valleys and you won't get in that even coloring. The second thing is um, that um, you'll get uh, little, little beads of water that sit in the crack by the tape and those little beads of water will uh, 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 pull back in and create blossoms in your background. Now look at my, can you see my, well, look at the red that separated out in my black. Can you see that? The bottom of my bowl is, is completely red. And I had that all shaken up and stirred before, before we came, uh, before we started today. That should do it though, because it was all ready. Uh, but I never do a black background with my hyperrealism with dry. You can never get the same uh, richness of color and you often get a little bit more granulation if you're working from dry paints. So even though I use dry paints in my palette, um, I've mixed up my own black paint that I keep. Um, this is the full thickness of the uh, straight out of the tube that I've mixed my own black. And I, you know, we don't have time to talk about it. Maybe at, at the end we can, but um, uh, then I mix it into a bowl to be kind of a milk consistency. And again, for the, these backgrounds, now I've already got, this is going to go super easy and fast this time because the water, it's not just getting sucked straight in. All of that pigment and the guar gum stabilizer, there we go. That thing is ready, ready to go just like that. And I'm going to, you can see why I mask everything out over here. Now you can leave some blue if you like to have some different colors, uh, but uh, showing through. Um, and I've often, if I don't get it on the first coat, I'll put another coat on, another coat. Now, one of the things that I wanted, ooh, that's kind of nice. I've got this kind of glow going on with the, the blue showing through in some places. And, um, but um, in these little areas in, in like this, if you just let that pigment run um, and sit and pool into these little spots, you're going to get the guar gum will come up to the surface and you'll get little shiny edges around your work. Have you ever seen that before? When you put in the background and the edges seem to have shiny and that's the buildup of the guar gum because there's too much paint in that location. 
So that's what I do now is I nurse it. I don't, can you see that there's a bead of water that's uh, a paint that's rolling around here. And then I will tend to hold it away so that the, uh, the paint will move farther away from that edge. So I won't get the buildup around the edge of the black. And there's the background. Um, and that's all there is to that. Um, there are reasons why it's good to put in the black at the end. There's reasons why it's good to put the black in at the beginning. Um, this is just what I'm experimenting with right now. And um, uh, Hey, Deb, somebody yeah. just asked you if the black was watercolor because it looked opaque. No, that's that black is watercolor paint. It's a mixture of it, the predominant colors are, it's got indigo, permanent alizarin crimson, and it has uh, some burnt sienna, but I've also got some other really great, even deeper browns than burnt sienna and some Windsor violet. So I'm using all of the, the three primary colors and the dark colors and I'm mixing it. Um, and unfortunately I can't show you how I get it to the point where it gets to that really true pure black, but that's just black. Uh, my, my palette that's in the handout, one of the things I wrote at the bottom is there is no white and there's no black in my palette. And that way there is no temptation to use it uh, because it doesn't, uh, it really doesn't compare to the gorgeous richness, the black that you can get when you mix your own color. So David, do you keep this, keep the black ready most of the time? So Say that again. Do you mix it? Do you mix the black? Do I keep it ready all the time? Yeah. No, no, I've got this mixed. I mixed a whole thing. So I used about three uh, full tubes of color because I do a lot of black backgrounds. So I used three, maybe four tubes of color before I got it all mixed. So this is, and it, this is just, um, oh, this is stuck. <laughs> there we go. This is just, it's watercolor out of the tube. Oh, okay. And I keep the, uh, the uh, saran wrap on it because that helps make sure it seals so it doesn't go moldy. Uh, when I'm working on a project, I mix it up in a bowl with water. So I get a nice consistency on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't do it on my palette because I want to have lots and lots. So I can just load my brush with the color and not worry about running out. This is a very small painting, but I usually do larger paintings. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I have plenty of color. Now, do you see what's happened while just while I'm waiting? I don't know if we can I show you. Do you see? Do you see the uh, how it's pooled here? Oh, yeah. That's going to go all shiny. So I'm going. You know, if I was uh, not working on this, I'm going to nurse it again. I'm going to try to get that little. Uh, there we go. See, it's gone again. Yep. And there's a bead across the top I'm getting rid of. Oh, and if I can show you this, this is so awesome. My husband built this for me. Okay, this is an old uh, desk lamp, art lamp. And my husband took, a, that wasn't working anymore. <laughs> he took it apart and he's an ele electrical engineer. He uh, screwed a blow dryer on it for me. So now I can, I'm not gonna dry this again. I don't want you to have to sit there and wait while I'm drying. I don't have time for that. And then I can work on this and keep the water moving. If it starts to warp at all, I can push it against the table. So I get, um, can you see what I'm doing? I'm pushing it against the table to keep it nice and flat so the pigment doesn't pool. Yeah, and, uh, and that way uh, I can work, work it and keep, keep it going until the whole thing is dry with my, I love my tool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions about that? That was that tool was very handy. Oh, what a sweet, <laughs> what a sweetheart your husband is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so just to show you, because I'm I'm doing with a demo with this too at some point. Uh, this one I did a red background before I'm putting the black on, and it will subtly affect the blacks, and then the blacks will harmonize with your your watercolor painting a little better. Uh, and it will shift the black slightly every time you change the background color. Okay. So, so what, what was the blue that you put around the edges? 
What was the, the blue fluid? What is this? No, no, the previous, the light blue that you put around everything. The light blue. It, it was, was the PBO. Oh, it was the PBO. That's, that's a masking fluid. Oh, that's the masking oh, the masking water. water. Masking fluid. But uh, I'll show you why I won't use that one. I just did it because I want you to be able to see. And I've been in so many workshops, especially online, and they hold it up and they go, okay, so can you see the white on the white? Can you see? You just, no, nobody can see the white on the white. <laughs> so I wanted to use the blue so you could see what I'm doing. Okay. All right, I'm going to use and put a, a fresh towel out get rid of all of that uh, color. Um, I love working on towels where I can just go right off the edges. I can wash my brush on it. I can uh, do everything, but this is a great surface too. This is a, uh, what do you call it? A uh, piece of vinyl that I bought at uh, the fabric store. Okay. Now, here's what you've got. I took off all of that masking and Here's the, here's the final uh, image of it. So now we've done, we've done our drawing and we, the, here's the next piece. Oh, let me show you first, see if I can, I'm gonna come down a little closer and I'll show you why I don't use colored masking fluid. Let's see. Oh, okay. Can you see that edge? I'm hoping you can see that. Yes. There's a line across here. Everywhere that I put that blue masking fluid, oh, it, shows. Yeah. it shows. And it's slightly discolored the paper. So, so what do you recommend, Deb? Um, it's on my it's on my list. I've okay. got I, I use just about any white. I use uh, the magic white. I use core Q O R. Um, I like that a lot. Paul Jackson makes one that you keep in your fridge that works really, really well. Um, and I've also used um, uh, Daniel, Daniel Jackson has one in a little squeeze tube, but I find I do much better with a, a little number one paintbrush than I do in the squeeze tube. But this one I keep upside down. So it's ready to roll. When you take this off, then you can just start drawing. But I find for this, it doesn't work quite well enough, not as fine enough on the detail as it does with a brush. So I, I wrote all those down. I don't, I haven't found one that I don't like, um, but I have found that Winsor Newton's yellow tinted one can leave a yellow tint. There we go. Can you see that? Look at that. Isn't that awful? And if you had put it on the outside edge that was gonna stay white, then you'd have this blue outline edge all around your artwork uh, on, on the white areas. So areas that need, you wanna keep pristine white, you don't want that to happen to it. Okay. One I'm, question, Debbie. Yes. One, um, so why do you mask halfway with that tape and halfway with the masking fluid? Why not with the masking fluid uh, like thicker well, because you'd use a whole bottle of masking fluid. Okay. And did you see how messy that black was? Yeah, I don't want to use a whole bottle of masking fluid. Um, also, masking fluid will tend to pick up a little bit of your pencil lines. So if you yeah. have really light pencil lines, they're not light here, but I do very light pencil lines. And uh, it'll often pick up a little bit of the pencil lines. And then I'm back in there trying to redraw some of the details after the okay. masking fluid comes out. That's a good tip. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is just cost effective. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, also, could you repeat the uh, black? Uh, uh, how did you make your own black? The color combination? Can you write that down and I'll put that in? Uh, I'll put sure. that in an email. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to share these things. It's like, ah, what do I tell you before we <laughs> run out of time? Mm -hmm. um, okay. The next thing is something that I think is really, really important. This is my photo again. Um, and I call that on my five Ds. This is the D number two and it's called define. And what I think, what has to happen now, we've defined the background, but we need to define what I consider the, uh, what I call the shapes and edges in, in the artwork. Um, there are um, really important shapes that you've got to get right. If, if you want to do um, uh, uh, hyperrealism, then certain things matter. So for instance, this edge of this bowl 
you know, needs to be really nice and clean. If you've got, you know, orange that's coming down into the bowl, what happens is, um, you know, or orange from here that you can't scrub off from the white area right in here, those kinds of things. What happens is objects from the foreground and objects in the middle ground or the background, um, they, don't, they don't sit where they're supposed to be because you've got pieces of the background that are, are coloring pieces of the foreground. And in order to really, the hyperrealism, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of hyperrealists are putting this black in because it makes everything stand out so beautifully and that helps it look real. Um, but so the next thing I'm doing though, when I want to decide where I'm going to work is I want to decide which are the important edges and which ones are the important shapes that I can paint together. This is, an, this is a, a shape that I could paint easily all in one, except that down here, do you see there's little bits of it in here? If you want it to be um, believable shadows, those shadows all have to, have to be the same, uh, the same value under there. So um, I'm going to come along and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use some masking fluid and I'm gonna cover these little areas so that I can come in and I can put in washes, I can put in the grays and I can go back and forth and back and forth and not worry about having to get in the cracks and paint and then you start getting uh, painting, you start getting paintbrush marks and it starts drying and then you get blossoms because you were so busy trying to get in there that you forgot it was drying over here. So if we do two things with our masking fluid, we save the whites, which most of us are familiar with saving the whites, but then we also, uh, uh, pay attention to our important shapes, the edges of things. This is an important edge. This is an important edge to make this stand out and look really three-dimensional in front of the oranges. This is an important shape here. You see where the blue ball separates from the oranges. It's not important that these oranges are all um, separate shapes. So what's going to happen is I will decide what I'm going to paint as a unit and what I want to separate out and create a crisp delineation on it. So these will all work together. I can paint all these oranges together. I could paint all these oranges together and I, I might break out that leaf or I might try to paint that whole thing as a unit. Okay. Um, I'll paint those two oranges together. I don't need to paint those separate. If we start trying to paint everything as a separate unit, you start getting that cookie cutter effect where everything looks like it's been painted separately and stuck together, you know, a paint by number. So, so this is always a balance between what do you want to paint together? What do you want to paint separately? And defining those really critical sharp edges in certain places on your painting is one of the things that really, really creates uh, believable hyperrealism. This is a beautiful edge here that you would absolutely not want to lose uh, if you want it to look like a napkin because napkins and tables don't bleed into each other. Now, I'm not saying this is the way you want to paint or it's the right way to paint or uh, you know, there's so many different ways to paint watercolor. Um, this, is, this is just the way it works for me. But I'm gonna show you, okay. So here I've masked. Uh, some different areas so I could work on. So I could work on this. I could work on the jug. I can work on all of these oranges together. So I've, I've saved the white space and I've, I've saved the edge and I'm going to work on that orange as well. Okay. Now I could probably go here and do the white napkin as well. Um, but I always tend to, I paint from the top down and I paint from the right to the left because then my hand is not rubbing in it. I'm, I'm just going to cover that all up and save it and work up here. And as I work down, I'm not rubbing and damaging my painting as I go. Okay. All right. So let's do a little, oh, let's do a little talk about color first. And again, you know, it's not a color or a workshop. Uh, um, 
you know, theory class, but I wanted to show you a couple things. One is, it, in the meantime, with all of this, I've gone out, I have a, a go-to palette, but I have gazillions of colors like most watercolorists do. Uh, all these amazing colors that they tried over time. So I pulled out all my oranges out of my drawer and my go-to palette. And um, one of the things I just wanted to show you, so I play around with this, but one of the things I always do is I always paint right off the edge of the paper. I see some people do beautiful little, you know, nice little square patches, you know, for their color samples. But when you go off the edge, you can go, oh man, look at that. Isn't that nice? Look at that orange, how it matches over here. And where was it? This, this is the Hansa Yellow Deep. We've got some yellows in here. Uh, yellow oranges that are looking really nice. So I'm going to be pulling some of that in here. Um, this is, uh, um, there's over here, these are mandarin oranges and they have, some of them have a little bit of this almost a fiery uh, red orange in them. So I can choose my colors more carefully by putting them on the edges like that. And I did the same thing with blue, trying to figure out, you can see I was a little more, this is usually what they look like <laughs> when I'm doing my colors. Uh, but I've ended up deciding on a combination that I liked that I'm gonna play with that has cobalt, French ultramarine and a little bit of violet in it. Um, I've got this blue and I've got this blue. So I haven't quite decided which, which way I'm gonna go if I'm gonna keep them different color blues or if I'm gonna shift something on them. But the other thing too that I wanted to show you is, um, uh, so it is to look at it, um, your shadows when you're looking at your colors. So I wanted to show you, I went into Photoshop. Let's move that out of the way so you see. I went into Photoshop and I actually took some pixels out of some of these different shadows in here um, and, then, and then created the box so you can see the different colors of shadows. Um, you know, the, the beginning watercolor classes, we're always told make it cooler, add a cooler color, uh, put in blue and violet shadows. And I constantly, or people are using gray uh, in their shadows. Um, and they say, you know, it looks kind of, you know, when you're doing fruit and flowers, you don't want gray um, in on your flowers. And you don't want all of a sudden to have a blue section that just looks like it doesn't belong to part of the flower. People really struggle with those shadows. And part of the reason is um, we, um, the way we, we tackle them. Mainly I think of taking this orange color and what do I need to add to this orange to make it more like this? And I would never just put blue on there but I can add a, I can add some blue and I can make this color. But that's the color I'm looking for. But uh, this color up here, which is much more orange, is reflected from the other orange. So it is much more orange. The shadow is more orange. Down here, it's picking up the blue from the bowl, you see, and it's creating uh, much more muted shadow colors. And then look over here, this orange was, has reflected light from that green leaf, which I've mostly covered up, but look at the color of that brown uh, be, that's being influenced in the shadow and the reflected light compared to over here by the blue and up here by the orange oranges. Um, so I don't normally do this. I just try to really pay attention to those colors in the shadows. Um, and I know shadows, are, shadows are, have, were always challenging for me. And I find that uh, artists are always asking me to be about the shadows. Um, but then I, okay, so back to this photo, you know, there's those three shadow colors, the main three shadow colors. And now look at this, look at this orange over here. Look, look at the color of that shadow on that orange. And that's pretty daring. People are always saying, whoa, how do you get such bright colors? And it's just because I pay attention to the true colors, the local colors of the objects, and I pay attention to the true value of these items. That is a really intensely brown shadow in there from the blue that has affected that orange. And so if you can pull in some colors, take your orange and add other colors to it to create this, 
you're really going to be rocking some awesome shadows that look really believable. Okay. It's really weird doing this online. <laughs> yeah. That okay. was a wonderful tip, Debbie. Thank you. And, you know, I, I think these things, these are, um, I'm making this seem like this is this long and odious process, but I do this with all my paintings and I, and I don't, I don't have to pull out color samples and things like that now because I really train myself to really, really look, wow, that's really red in there. Nobody told me to put a red shadow on an orange. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me to put a brown shadow on the orange. Now I'd say, oh, I need to put some blue and violet in there. But you know, in the past, I might've tried putting blue and violet or violets on top of it and it never looked right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, we're going to come back to this. Um, so now I've got, there are, there are three more Ds uh, that, I pay, that I think are really important in your painting. And they're the same thing that you would, you know, talk about um, uh, with any one of your painting. One is, so my, the, the next three Ds are called deeper, darker, and details. Those are the next three Ds. And we need deeper color, we need darker values, and then we need more detail. More pay attention to the little details, more attention to the details. When I was in art school, uh, one of my teachers said, watercolor artists tend to stop at 85%. They stop at 85% of the color they really wanted. They stop at 85% of the value. They only get up to a seven or an eight on a 10, on a scale of 10. And they never get to those really deep, rich colors. So if you want form, if you want things to really, really uh, roll and have excellent form on them, the shadows are really critical. And that means you've got you've to go 100% on the color. You've got to go 100% on the value and you've got to go 100% on the details. And I, I go back and forth and back and forth. Um, it's not like I do all color and then all value push the dark and then all details. But um, those are three that I build. And I start with um, a deeper color. And then, well, I start by priming my paper. Let's do the prime of my paper. Um, I do a lot of um, crystal and I do a lot of silver and I do a, and I do a lot of white. And one of the things that you need to do uh, that, um, that is really, really helpful is, um, uh, I learned this from Lauren McCracken. This is just this cheap O plastic palette. And I just put tape on it so that they didn't all evaporate. And then you'd have to sit there and watch me mix all my colors again. So, um, and I didn't want you to do that. But I wanna prime this. Now for those, chat, for those whites to look white, even though it's a white vase, those little white highlights can't look white if you leave this white. So I'm going to, um, and it's gonna be so easy. Look at this, I can just paint around there all I want to, and I don't have to worry about getting, you see how easy it is? Look at that, it's just so easy. This is just plain water. This is a, um, uh, synthetic, uh, not a synthetic, this is a sable brush because it holds lots and lots of water. And I'm just going within about a quarter inch of the edges. I'm not going right to the edges yet. And even here, you see I blocked it off so I don't have to worry about messing up that orange and getting all of that in there. And then what I'm gonna do with all these colors, I'm gonna start on this one, which is my lightest gray. I have four different grays. This is a neutral tint. And then I have the full blast paint here, full thicknesses. So I'm going to just come in here and start. I want a nice smooth color. I don't have to worry about it all leveling out because I got lots of water. I don't have to worry. I can just, I can watch you and I don't make any mistakes on the edges. Okay. And come around here. That's looking good. It's just like a 10% gray. 
Now I'm gonna take my really fine pointed synthetic. This is gonna have lots of layers. So, you know, I'm gonna just try to get nice and close to the edge. Some of those things, okay. You see, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna stand over on the, oh, you can't see me, can you? Um, but I stand over on the other way, I'll turn it around, right? Because I always, I wanna watch that leading edge. I'm using a very fine point synthetic uh, paintbrush to get right up to those edges. And now because I can lift it up, okay, I can move it all around. Oh, I want a little more there. And I know it's gonna be darker over on this side so I can take a slightly darker color of gray and I can put some in to just get that color rolling. So do you put this when it's still wet, is it, the previous layer? Ask again? Do you put the second layer when, when it is the first one is still wet? No, I'm. this is all part of the first layer. Oh, okay. You know, I get a little impatient. <laughs> I, you know, I throw in a little more, a little more color. But see, I don't even have to mix my blacks because I know, oh, I want it a little darker. I want a little more just water. I can, I can go up and down the scale, this value scale. All right, that was maybe a little too much, but it's going to be great inside there. Right? Okay, I'm just gonna let that dry. So this is how I, and I prime the paper because I tell you the next layer and the next layer will just go on so beautifully smooth because you've already primed the paper and now it has, it doesn't just suck it in. I got it all wet because I tell you, if you start, oh, look at that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, I'll lift it up again, water drops because it's nice and wet. Look at that, even though I dripped in it, it's it's all leveling out really nice. Is there any danger? I noticed you were being really careful as you got close to the to the edges there. Is there any danger of um, that really deep dark color that you have in the background bleeding in if you if you do ex get to um, get up to it? Yes. There is a danger of it bleeding in, but but you know what? If it bleeds in a little bit, um, then um, it'll, it'll help round the shape a little bit. <laughs> it, it creates nice shadows. Uh, you do need to, to uh, drop it in, but that's why I never take that, you know, that first wash, which is really wet. You don't want to touch the, the dark black background with mm. that because then it'll bleed all over the place. Mm. But as, as you start working with drier and drier layers, and it's drying up a bit, you can come really close and right up and touch that edge and, uh, and fill it in. Can you see that? Yeah, just don't scrub it. Don't get it really sopping wet and don't go, don't go up and down and up and down. We don't wanna be doing a lot of brush strokes right now anyways, because we wanna create a really nice smooth edge on that, uh, 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 finish on it. Same thing here uh, for this piece. Um, this is white as well, but it's got a lot of, all the whites are saved. So we need to have something in here. So I'm gonna put a foundation color on here. Okay, that was easy, wasn't it? Whew. Because it's all the edges are protected. All right, and then for the oranges, uh, the lighter orange colors tend to be um, uh, more of a yellow orange. So I'm going to start with that. Um, I think it's Hansa Yellow Deep. Do you see, I'm going to stay without with from a quarter inch from the edge, but I'm I can come all the way around, nice and close and up to that. Let's take. Uh, And this is about defining the shapes that you want to work together. Okay, I'm just going to put down Yeah, see that got a little a little thick there. Whoop. So I'm just going to add lots I can add lots more water right now. Um, and I it just, you know, you go, wow, why does she do all that is so much work take so long doing all that masking and then she's going to take the masking off. That's maybe looking a little too, 
I'm gonna. Oh wow, that looks super, super bright in the in the camera, but it's not that bright. Um, but now, do you see, because I'm make I'm painting them all together, they're gonna sit on the same plane, and they're gonna have this really crisp edge. Uh, below now I if I you know if I'm gonna fuss I'm gonna get it all the way up to the edge and again you see how I'm always got my leading edge of my paintbrush I want to see where the tip of my paintbrush is um, I always turn my my paintbrush and I turn my paper so that um, I always have that leading edge okay and look this one too let's get some we'll get some color on this one as well and define that so there we've got the first four objects. That's the first thing that we do is get some color on it so that we can start seeing the shapes. This isn't that hard to see the shapes on this painting, um, but some of my paintings are um, two feet by three feet. And, the, and when you're doing cut crystal, there are a thousand little components to it. And it's really helpful to start getting in some foundation color. Um, that's just looking way too screaming orange to me. There we go. That's better for a foundation color. Okay. So those are, I've primed the paper. I'm starting to see the objects. Okay. And um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. So I've been working, I did a couple more um, coats of paint on um, so these are 11 by 14 and I liked this picture so much I decided I wanted to do a 16 by 20. Um, so this is one of my really good ones. So now you, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, one of my really good paintings. Okay. And, and how I work on it later. I don't want to. Okay. So I'm going to zoom way up because it's a bigger painting. Now, one of the things that you can see that I've done on here is um, I took some of that tracing paper and I put it back on uh, because my hand is rubbing here on that white napkin. Uh, and I wanted to make sure I kept that pristine white. I, I just taped a piece of paper down there so my hand is not going to pick up phthalo blue <laughs> or something like that and rub it all right in the middle of my white napkin. And I want to keep, I don't want to drip on that black because I tell you, if I have to go back and paint that black all over again at the end, I'm going to be really annoyed at myself. So here is, but, but for now, I'm going to take it off. Look at that beautiful black background. Isn't that gorgeous? It's just That's really, really even. really gorgeous. And I, lo I love the way the blue came through. You see the blue here? Yeah, that really excited me. So here is where I'm, this has already had, so this has had three layers of paint on it. Okay. And this is, you can see this is where, so, so the first one deeper, we need deeper color. So this is the foundation layer. Then I put another layer on all on, on, and I only did one of each because I, just to show you where I can look at where the lights and darks are going to be in it. Okay. And then I start deepening the local color. The local color means forget about the shadows and the highlights and everything else. What color is the object itself? So I start deepening this up, adding these oranges. And in this one, then I went in and I darkened the value so that it would match. Um, same thing here, uh, uh, adding in layers and layers of color. Now, one of the things, again, it's that 85% rule. If you, um, you, when I started putting this in, I'm going, whoa, way too dark. Oh, too dark. No, that's looking pretty good with the oranges. But here's another trick that I do. Um, now, and I, I printed out these photos. I print, these are not glossy photos. I have a really wonderful printer because when I had glossy photos, you couldn't see them for the demo. But what I'll do is I'll take uh, one of my paintings, uh, one of my photos, and I'll cut it up. So let's take a look at those oranges. And I can, and unfortunately, it's not quite the right size. But look at the color I'm trying to achieve. 
Can you see that? You know, this really helps me know. People say, how did you, how, how do you get that really rich, realistic orange color? Well, it's because I compare it over and over and over again to the real thing. All right. So this is, this is, this is going great. It's in the right direction. It's a, a much more yellow orange. This one I haven't started. This one is needs one more coat of paint and it's going to get more of the orange. Now let's take a look at this one. This one I added the darker values on it and let's take a look at that. That's pretty darn good if you ask me um, how close I've gotten to the real thing. And um, so I'm always cutting things apart and comparing um, to, and what I'll do is I'll do that and then I'll um, go on the back, I'll, I'll take, well, that doesn't go together obviously, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take the pieces back together and then I'll cut them on a different, in a different, I'll cut them in a different location uh, uh, so that I can compare some different edges. Um, let's take a look at this one. Okay. This isn't the best camera for it, but it works. Okay. So, oh, so sorry. All right. I thought this was looking pretty gosh darn good there, but when I put this up against it, wow, that color's not working yet. First of all, it's not, uh, I, I've totally missed the orange in the shadow. Do you see the orange in there? And it's not dark enough yet. So one of the things that I do often is to isolate and look at colors on my photos and look at colors on this. Okay, let's take a look at that. There's my painting and there's the photo. Look at the difference in that. The difference in the color and the difference in the value. That's not done yet. That's what I mean by stopping at 85%. It looks okay and you think it's okay, but the reality is it hasn't pushed it to the 100% that will make the realism look real. Now, this is not doing so bad down here. Do you see that? Look at the match on the orange in the shadow there. So I'm pretty satisfied there, but now look at the, look at the handle. You see the difference in the handle? The handle needs to go way back into the shadows. So even though I'm happy with the way the handle is starting to look, it still needs to be pushed way back into the shadow to be believable. Because that's where, how could, how could I have, have bright highlights this close here when it's this dark in the shadow here? So that shadow doesn't make sense there. Um, and then the same thing again here is, this is looking pretty good, but it's just because we're looking at it against a white background. And uh, I cut this up and now look at, look at the difference. Oh, sorry, no, you can't see the difference. Even though the, the, the photo has a slightly pinkish cast, I'm ignoring that, but let's look at, look at, look at the, uh, right in there, look at the difference of the, the color of the shadow in the object itself in the photo and look at the color that I've painted it. So that one has a long way to go. Okay, any question about that? That's a fantastic tip. Oh, thanks. You know, it's, we see everything in context, but using this and using a grayscale, if you want to look at your photo, you can also take, take a grayscale and go, well, what is that? That's closest to, yeah, that's probably about on this scale, it's a value four. And if you squint, you don't even notice the color. You what you want to do is you want to squint at those squares until you can't see the square anymore. And if it's the, if it's the same value, you won't notice the color while you're squinting. So that's about a value four, but I put on here. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. That's not, that's not even a five. That's maybe a six. six. Yes. Okay. So those are two tools that I use all the time to, to compare my value. So, deeper color, deeper color, really, really pay attention to what the real colors are in the objects, darker values, and then finessing the details. Um, up here, I've taken the masking fluid off a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's, this is a beautiful, beautiful line on here, but that kind of mucks up that gorgeous, you know, round edge up there needs a lot of work before that will actually 
read as real. Um, so you've got to you do work on those details. And I have a couple of different tools I put on the supply list for that Debbie, as well. Debbie, what yes. do you call those squares that you use? The one with the grayscale and the other one where you're comparing? Well, this is just, it's, uh, it's called a value finder. You can find it at any art store. Okay, so, and it's a value scale. Doesn't matter what the numbers are. It's just, you know, this one has, it looks like about eight, uh, eight grays on it. But I find that very helpful. This is just, I cut that out with an X-Acto knife, just on a piece of paper. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so the last thing I just wanted to say, because I can, I can go back here. Oh no, not the last thing, but oh, I'm gonna have to stop talking soon, aren't I? Um, what did I do with my, there it is. Okay, I'm not going to, so once you've done a section, if my oranges were done, I'm gonna take off this masking fluid here. Oh, and by the way, look at this. I'm gonna have to remask it. Yep. But look, look at those edges. Look at that, the edge of that vase and how it was so worth being able to paint those shadows all the way down into the cracks and not have to paint around any of those shapes. And that gives you beautiful edges. Um, can you show the tool you're using for removing the mask? Say that again? Can you show the tool you're using for uh, removing yep. the mask? It's just a mask remover tool. It's a piece, it's like a piece of rubber. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, you know, for masking fluid, just look up for remover. Okay, so I'm going to take this off and the same thing again, just to show you, look at how beautiful that is. I'm going to be able to put in that, that blue edge in there. I'm going to be able to put in white highlights and those uh, oranges, even though I haven't finished painting them, I'll, I'll remask it and repaint them. Uh, but I wanted to show you how nicely and evenly, if I was painting it by hand, I probably would have gone outside the line and, and then I'd redefine the line and then I'd go back and I'd try to smooth it and then the bowl would be a little bit lopsided. I don't know if, if you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I'm guessing you do. Um, but now the, the problem is once you've got this off, now, if I want to start doing the blue, I can't put masking fluid on the oranges because it'll pick up some of your paint. Oh, okay. So now we need to try to do something slightly different because you don't want to use masking tape on your painted areas uh, because it will show. Okay, so I'm going to show you it's kind of an, an escalating scale. This is just a, a scrap piece that I, I'm working with. So, you know, one thing you can do, we've looked at is you can put masking fluid in and you can create a really great shape, right? Now, the second thing that I do that is really non-invasive, and this is on my list. I put down, I said, uh, green, Scotch's green automotive repair tape. And I got this from uh, Jeff McCormick. Jeff McCormick uh, won uh, CWA a couple first uh, best of show a couple years ago. And he does abstract paintings, but he does it with uh, perfect lines. And um, so this, uh, this tape uh, he introduced me to, and what's great about it is it comes in all different widths, okay? So I, uh, I just wanna show you what's so awesome about this. You see this line here and you go, well, I want to, I want to mask along that line um, and then put something else. I'm just going to sh show you on this side. I can put, push it down here and then I can stretch the tape. Mm. And look at that. Isn't that awesome? That is, that is so handy. Yep. And then I still take my razor blade. You don't pull because you don't want to stretch the, the, um, the edges and uh, you don't want to touch the edges. And then I burnish it down with my fingernail 
because that doesn't leave any oils. This gives you a really nice flat area and no oils. So that's the second thing I can do if the shape's not too awful. The last thing I can do is I put my drafting tape and I put down on the uh, on your list, do not use masking tape. Uh, right now, Alvin drafting tape has changed their formula. It doesn't work on cold pressed paper very well. Um, I only use pro, um, pro brand drafting tape. And the reason why is you can see, can you, you can see through it beautifully. So now I can take my X-Acto knife and I can cut the tape and I can do any shape I want to, you see? And then I can lift it off. You have to be careful while pressing it, right? Because it should not damage the paper. That's right. And again, but I do it, I, I rub it with my fingernail. Sorry, what tape is that again? This is, the brand is Pro and it's called drafting tape. Okay, thank you. And it looks like masking tape, but it is not masking tape. There's mm. Pro brand drafting tape. You want to make sure it says drafting tape. And like I said, Alvin has changed their formula and it's nowhere near as sticky anymore. Um, this does not, this, uh, you know, you have to take it off very carefully that, so you don't rip anything and you have to be careful because sometimes you'll get a, a little bit of a cut line in the painting, you know, so you have to be careful, but, uh, and then I just, you know, I really, really score that down. And now if you had done this painting first and then you said, oh, I want to put in a black background. You could go all the way around that fancy edge. You could go around all of those uh, figs that I showed you with all those tiny little things, but I don't wanna have to do that and cut my tape. Uh, so um, in all those fancy shapes, unless I have to. So that's my third choice. This, this works great. The tape is beautiful, uh, This the nice thin tape, and it comes in all different thicknesses, but this, this quarter inch is terrific because of how stretchy it is. Um, and you can go around those shapes. And then you can also use drafting tape and you can cut those edges to mask them. So if I was coming back to this painting, if these were all done, I would put, I would probably in this case, I would probably uh, do it this way. And put this in. What's the name of this tape, Debbie? This is Scotch brand, and I believe there's a number to it. Look on the list. I think it's called the 233 plus. 233? Yep. See? Oh, it's so hard. 233 plus. It's automotive. Mending tape. Jeff McCormick used to, did I, he said, I, he used to paint um, a, a surfboards. He's an avid surfer, he lives in Eugene, Oregon now, but <laughs> no surfing there. And he used to paint surfboards and he used to paint motorcycles. And this is what they use on uh, surfboards and motorcycles and stuff to, to put down and then paint over top, pull it away and you get those gorgeous pipe, you know, perfect piping line work on the uh, on those graphic designs. Mm -hmm. So you see now I can come in here and I can put my blue in. And then um, I will have that beautiful definition between the bowl that is farther in the foreground, the oranges that will sit together because I painted them all together as one unit and, and that will sit a little farther away because that um, edge is so important and I and I've taken the time to make sure it's a perfect edge. And that's it. <laughs> hey Debbie, Debbie on that last part the uh, green tape. Yes. When you when you lift it up after it's all dried and everything, it yeah. doesn't pick up it doesn't pick up the color, right? No. Okay, good. No. 
you know, it, no, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it comes out beautifully. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's part of my, uh, my uh, iPhone holder there. Sorry about that. Debbie, you've given away all your secrets to us. I have given away all your secrets. Now uh, we are all going to be masters. <laughs> so drawing. So number one is uh, your, so your five Ds. Number one is the drawing. And in art school, they always said, color can never save a bad drawing. Okay, and that really stuck with me. I understand that some people say I don't want to do photos and I don't want to do co copy drawings. That's okay. It's a different kind of painting, but uh, it's very hard to stay hyper realistic if you don't have the right ellipse shape on the bowl and those kinds of, kinds of things. And you don't get to change those things after the fact with watercolor. Uh, because it's too much fiddling and uh, damages your painting too much. So that's number one, you're drawing. Number two is define your important edges and define your groupings that you want to paint together so that they relate to each other. These are important edges because we, that gives us the opportunity to paint in here all together and smoothly, okay? This white edge on here is Sorry, I'm, it's so big, is an important edge. So define your important edges and take care of those important edges, okay? So that's number two, define. Number three is deeper. And you've got to go deeper in color uh, for it to be hyper-realistic, okay? And people say, I've tried really hard, but if you take that, that out here and take a look at it, you know you're not there yet, okay? Um, so I don't want my oranges that color. <laughs> I want to eat oranges that are that color. So deepen your color. You probably stopped at 85%. And I tell you, I tell myself that all the time. I, and, I, and I'm always telling myself is, have I gone beyond 85%? Have I gone beyond 85% in color? Have I gone beyond 85% in my values? Uh, because those deep, dark values uh, in, in here, Look at, look at that, it's almost black back there in the shadow inside that bowl. That is going to make it believable and make everything pop out as three-dimensional. So that's the deeper color, darker values, and more attention to the detail. And that's once you've taken the masking fluid off you and you come back, and you fix the little edges on things and you use little scrubber brushes and smooth out those things. Um, I can often spend two days with a, with a little, with a little uh, scrubber brush smoothing out edges on, on a big painting after I think I'm all done. Um, but uh, those are, again, um, Please don't all become hyper-realistic watercolor painters. I'm, I'm pretty unique in this. <laughs> so, uh, and most people say, why, why, would you, why would you paint this way? And like I said, it's not about that I want to paint this way. It's about that I'm achieving the, the, the kind of finesse and details that just sing and give me joy uh, looking at the objects and looking at the paintings when they're done and marveling in crystal and sunlight and reflections and flowers and fruit. And that's what, that's what really excites me. And uh, so I'll be sitting here going, hey, well, you know, sometimes when you've done, I think one of my paintings had like, like almost 400 strawberry seeds in it. I wasn't like feeling too much joy at the moment <laughs> while that was going on. Um, questions? I, I don't know where we're out of time, I guess. Yeah, uh, hey, but, um, maybe I have a question. Um, my name is Meva. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, what kind of printer do you have? That looks pretty darn good. What kind of printer? Oh, I have an Epson 3880. It prints up to 17 by 22 because I print giclés. It has nine ink cartridges in it. Um, 
Uh, I have an Epson scanner and an Epson printer, and I use Epson paper. And uh, again, when you use a system, I, and it's not that Epson is the be all and end all, but because I have all the consistency, they work beautifully together. Um, so yes, it does, it does beautiful printing uh, for me. So I'm very, very lucky to have a good scanner and a good printer uh, to support me with what I'm doing. Uh, but honestly, I'm doing a huge painting right now. Um, mm. I'm not going to do any more Shuba if you want to just put it on me instead. Yeah, so maybe I do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, uh, I don't have a printer that, that goes big enough. So I had to print it out in six photos and tape it all together mm -hmm. in order to uh, create my pencil drawings. So I do a lot of cut and paste. I, I print what I can at home um, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, tape, tape it all together. It works great. Hey, Deb, did you show the final painting? Did you already show? I did. I know this is my final painting that I'm, I'm just starting to work on. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we will, uh, yeah, when, how long do you take to complete a painting? Uh, uh, um, well, this will be done next week. Oh, good. Uh, you need to understand that I'm, so I'm doing this full time professionally and um, an easy week for me is 50 hours. Wow. <laughs> so I'm working. So I'm in two local galleries. I'm at Viewpoints Gallery in Los Altos, and I'm at Gallery 24 in, uh, in Viewpoints is Los Altos. Gallery 24 is in Los Gatos. Oh, They're yeah. both on my website. Um, and um, I, I work there. If you ever want to find out, you can. Either one of those galleries, if you ever drop in, you can say, when is Debbie working? If you want to come in and say hi and chat about watercolor, we are open, we wear masks uh, and socially distance, uh, but both galleries are open and they're doing just fine right now. So we've been really lucky. People are getting tired of looking at the same old art <laughs> in their houses and deciding on some changes. So. Um, uh, you're, you're welcome to drop in. They're both co-op galleries, so we do do our own staffing. So I'm in and out of each gallery once or twice a month. Um, and um, I also, on my handout, you'll also find, uh, so my website is just my name, Debbie Backer. You need to remember that it's not Baker and there are two Ks in it, or you won't <laughs> <laughs> and I am I am not Debbie Backer the supermodel and I am not Debbie Backer the Dutch tennis player and I'm not Debbie Backer the Canadian Avon sales lady <laughs> there's a lot of Debbie Backers out there <laughs> um, that I, I run into but Deb, Debbie Backer art Debbie Backer artist you'll find me but my website is just my name Debbie Backer and I have a contact form there. If you want to be on my uh, email list, uh, I send stuff out about three times, four times a, uh, uh, a year is about all I, all I send out. Um, but uh, Debbie Backer Art also on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, please do reach out and uh, let me know. Let me know if any of this was uh, interesting helpful to you um i'd love to hear back from you i have a question yes yeah uh thank you for the demo it was really great i love the tips and um i was wondering have you tried uh portrait work with the watercolor oh uh. <laughs> okay <laughs> Y'all give me a flower any day. I did a few portraits. I, I did a, a class quite a few years ago with Ted Nuttall. I thought, oh, he's so loose and colorful and he's just gorgeous. And I really want to channel Ted Nuttall's portraits. And I got commissioned to do a couple of portraits. And then I said, I'm never, ever doing that ever again. Um, I leave it to the people that love painting people. I, I, I will okay. paint a still life or a flower any day before I'll tackle people. Um, so please, please do fill that void that I <laughs> created by not painting people. Um, 
uh, yeah, I just, um, again, you know, trying to be such a, a perfectionist and getting the, you know, yeah, the, the, oh, good portrait painters are, are just amazing, just amazing, aren't they? When they, when they truly capture someone's spirit and energy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, oh, go ahead. Thank you so much. You did a nice presentation in a very short time, gave us a lot of tips. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It is a, it was a lot. I, I did, I covered a lot of things, but that's also why I, um, uh, do it in stages because, uh, I want, I want to be able to help you see how I go through the whole process. Um, so you've just gotten just like a, a just a, a, like a sneak preview at each of each one of the <laughs> stages that I go through with my paintings. Yeah. And then I just jump around and I finish it all and look at it and adjust it, you know, as I go, um, because it does have to work as a whole. So eventually I'll just put that photo away and I'll just look at it and try to decide what it is it needs that's beyond the photo. So this was, this was a fantastic demo. Thank you. Can you share some of your other paintings in your walls? Can you show us? If oh, you well, uh, like the stones, bit. the rocks in the back. This looks very interesting. Yeah, it's hard under glass. This is I did this one for my husband. This is a beach we were on in British Columbia. Wow, that's uh, that, fabulous. Uh, yeah, up in Canada. We're both Canadians, so. I finally did him with a Canadian the uh, in the fall with the Canadian maple leaf and rocks. Uh, and again, I used a lot of masking on this one on the edges. <laughs> and I tell you, if I had used that PBO fluid, it would have great like those bluey gray outlines on all my rocks mm, would be yeah. a disaster taking it off. Um, do I have anything else? No, I think I showed you mostly uh, some of my new work. Um, um, the, the sunflowers I have back here, yeah. um, I, 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 the, the, I, I started and stopped it a bit two or three times and was unhappy about it. So this is one that I cut up after the fact because it was not a successful start. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so we are out of time, but there was one last question. I think, Denise, you were on, about to ask. If, yeah, if, I was curious. I, I seem to recall in... I think it was the information about you. I, I think this was you. Uh, something about that you also sometimes uh, do watercolor in in such a way that you don't need to frame it under glass. Yes. So how, oh, so, how does that work? So two things. Yes, real quick. Uh, do I have time, Shiba? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think we're fine. Okay. That way, because yeah, because I, I had said that maybe I would uh, talk about that. So number one, here's my. This is the new painting. Like this is my painting that I'm working on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is on a new product made by a company called Raymar. R-A-Y-M-A-R. Raymar, okay. And it's raymarart.com. There's another company that's raymar.com. Don't go there, because mm -hmm. it's, and you'll get all confused. Raymar. It is Fabriano cold pest paper that has been, uh, put down on an aluminum panel, oh. huh. okay? So this, I could put this in and it never works. Hmm. It never buckles. Uh, you can just work with it uh, so easily with this pan, with a panel like this. Look at that, even that's kind of looking cool already, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You can start to start to see the, the forms coming out with just a little bit I've done so far. Um, anyway, so, and this is on aluminum. Okay, so um, if you want to know more about that, Matthew Bird has a blog and he talks a lot about Raymar. He's the one that worked with Raymar to get this Fabriano paper, I believe, on the, on the solid background. So I do this, my big painting of the rocks is done on a Raymar panel as well, and wow. I will be varnishing it. And oh, then I'll drop mm -hmm. it into a frame the same way as if it was a canvas, if it was an oil painting or an acrylic oh. painting. And it's super thin, so you can put it in any frame you want. Oh. Oh. How do you varnish it with? What do you varnish it with? Well, that's another whole demo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but just to show you also, 
couple other things that I do for that I because I don't. Um, so you've seen the wood panels. Have you seen the artwork on wood panels? Yeah, I, we, we get uh, aqua board, right? But, but aqua board. Oh, this no. is not aqua board. This is just a wood box. Oh, this is only the panel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a birch birch panel. But what I do is so here's a couple, um, and then I can you see that? Yeah. So I painted my painting, and then I glued it down. I'm going to do some videos eventually probably after the holidays. Uh, and you can, you can find these on YouTube, you, lots of things. And I glued it onto the wood panel and then I dropped it into a frame. Wow. And I put on with a satin finish, so it's got a nice sheen to it, but there's no glass. And here's, here's another one. I have a whole series of, uh, that I call it doorways. Wow. And that's a, it's a door knocker, yeah. This and this one way. has, I, this one I painted my wood box, uh, I painted it black on the mm. sides and put it in a frame that had black inside it too. So you get this really great okay. dra dramatic black edging in there. Yeah. Uh, so sure. again, uh, there's a, you can find it on YouTube. Um, and uh, if you end up going on my, on my asking to be on my email, You'll you'll uh, uh, find out when I'm going to post some videos on it too, um, but to me this makes such a difference. If you got if you get into Los Gatos, uh, the Gallery Twenty Four has five, six, no, nine, nine or ten of my paintings right now, um, and none of them have glass on them. So do you use watercolor on the wood? No, I do watercolor on the paper. This is this is watercolor paper. This is Fabriano watercolor paper that's been glued down. And the same thing here. This is Fabriano watercolor paper that I've glued down and then I varnished it. Yeah, yeah. this is the this is the benefit we get uh, doing the virtual uh, demo so that we can see them. <laughs> so you can see more artwork in the, from your studio. So. Yeah, but it's really nice. It, and I know this is not the time to say, come on down to the gallery. But um, the uh, if if you're in right now, my artwork at Los Altos, uh, there's a lot of watercolor people there that do it without glass. But my some of these hyper realisms that I showed you the, the photos of right at the very beginning, they're the ones that haven't sold are, are hanging at Gallery 24 right now okay. uh, through the through January 1st. Yeah. So. Good. Okay, so this was a great demo. Actually, we were just wondering why oh, we had impressions last week and how the artists artist were uh, very busy last week, so how they would do it this week. But everybody was here, I think each and every minute, I think we learned a lot. I think we learned a lot in two hours and we have the recording and we can share it with everybody to watch later. I think well, thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I've, I've, I've taught, I taught uh, university level classes for years and I, I taught kids for years. So uh, teaching is one of my other loves too. So I, I just want to thank you for letting me come and share all this because it makes me happy teaching people as well as my painting. <laughs> Um, one last question. Are you working with other media or just watercolor is your favorite? I actually do, uh, I do scientific murals at West Valley College uh, mm -hmm. and for the biology department there. Those are all done in acrylic uh, paint. Um, it's unfortunate uh, in the spring we, they have a wildflower show and we do a tour of all the murals that I've painted there for them. Um, but we haven't been able to, uh, to do the tours lately. Um, but I, um, I have a lot of allergies. I'd, I'd love to play with other mediums, but I won't, my studio is in my home and, uh, even, um, uh, acrylic paints, I couldn't paint with full time and I wouldn't want them in my home. Uh, to, I, my home has to be my safe place for my allergies. So mm -hmm. watercolor, it is for the rest of my life. Uh, uh, so I just that's have wonderful. To... Can I can I have one question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so have you tried um, acrylic and watercolor together on any painting? I I just I haven't, Janky. Just be again because 
and I've taken some classes. I can tolerate going to a, an art studio and I'll take three days of acrylic classes, but then I need to get home and get out of, get out of, the out of all of this. <laughs> so I just haven't, and people go, acrylic doesn't smell well. Yeah, if you're allergic to plastics, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just haven't experimented with it. It's just not something that I can do. Yeah. <laughs> It was a fabulous demo and thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing all your oh, valuable thank tips. You, thank you. And do you know one, one other thing and I, what I forgot we didn't do is that we didn't go back to my paintings at the beginning. I wanted to go back to the paintings and, and have you look at my rule of thirds and I want you to look at even in my flowers, where did I mask important edges and what did I paint together? But you can go to my website, debbiebacker.com yes. and go in and look at my paintings and you'll start to see how I yeah. used these techniques and you go, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got one petal that has to be perfect right up front and it's, it's, it's just got to be dead on. And you know that I've use that masking technique right there because I want that pedal to come around and be in front of everything, you right, know? Right, and those right. kind of things. So please do count, just look at my website to, to see, sure. and you'll see, doesn't matter what I paint, all of these principles apply to all of them. I look at your website many times, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll see some pictures who's showing it. Janky is a fan. We need to talk tomorrow. Yes. I'm hoping you learned something, Janky. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I have learned a lot. It Very was a great nice. Yes. I think, yeah, I think maybe if we have another session, we will uh, again enjoy the same way, I think. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've got anything left, but um, as I told you, I'm not going to leave you. <laughs> okay, good. So we are, we are. Well, even if you don't want to be a hyper realist painter, you know, these, these are all different concepts and techniques. I tried to show you things that, that you can use in your own painting. You can use them in your own style uh, that, that they're because they're tools. Yeah. And it's just about choosing which tools are going to help you achieve what you're trying to achieve in your paintings. Yes. This has been a really one of the outstanding demos. It's one of, one of the best demos I've ever watched. Good. Yes, thank and, you. Oh, and we're over time, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are 12 minutes over time, but I think we are enjoying. So with that, we can say we are can done, we're done for today, but I want to make sure we capture ourselves for the tool attended. So if you can turn on your video so that I can take the- Okay, faces. And yes. <laughs> Cool. But I'm recording. I will find out who left and went to bed, right? <laughs> no, it's a, it's okay. You won't get everybody. Second, can you show your, yeah, video. Oh, your camera is off. That's okay. You won't get everybody. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm recording so that I can, uh, I, yeah, I will record so that it doesn't show the name. But maybe let me take the screenshots. Oh, can you do that? Oh, interesting. These are all important for me, <laughs> just to share it in, uh, uh, yes. To show it, share it in our newsletters, that come like it was okay. uh, uh, some turnout and everyone stayed back for full, full time. So, yeah. So a wonderful uh, demo. Thank, Thank you, you, Debbie. Thank you. Every you. Minute. That was really great. I'm not, yeah. I'm not Thank even you. a watercolor, so it was very <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. It's a beautiful, beautiful demo. Okay. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thanks so much for uh, Thank you so coming much. to your homes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Bye. It was Thank awesome. You. Bye. 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 Wonderful. <laughs> so great. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, one.